Grace wins every time. Every time. Not just when it's convenient. And not just when you're broken. But grace wins every time. Grace is an essential part of God's character. Grace is closely related to God's benevolent love and mercy. Grace can never be defined as God's favor toward the unworthy or God's benevolence to the undeserving. In his grace, God is willing to forgive us, bless us abundantly. In spite of the fact that what we do or what we don't do, God's love for us is treated with love from the father to a son or a daughter to a father. God's love. His grace. See, the Bible says that when we come to the house of God, there's a lot of things that we can miss out on. But there's one thing that we can't miss out on. And if we miss out on this one thing, what are we doing? What are you doing within your life? What we can't miss out on is grace. We, when we get religion without grace, what good is religion? What good is knowing the rules and knowing the Bible, but not have the grace and the love and the forgiveness? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, it says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, by this many become defiled. When we look through the lens of religion instead of the lens of grace, we lose the fact of grace. When grace becomes a word, but if it doesn't become a passion, it is religion. When we look at grace, we have to look at grace with the lens, now the filter of something that is not very popular. But we all have to go through it. When we look at the lens of grace, we have to look through the lens of sin. Now, I'm not going to talk about my sin. I'm going to talk about your sin. Because your sin is worse than my sin, right? Because you're a dirty, rotten sinner, and you don't deserve to go to heaven. Because you have sinned. I'm a preacher. I don't sin that bad. So I don't need grace near as bad as you need grace. Right? Guess what? Sin is what? Sin. Just because I don't sin like you sin doesn't mean I don't need grace like you need grace. So I can't sit up here nor you can sit out there and say you're worse than me or I'm better than you because sin is sin, and we all need grace. You are as dirty, rotten sinner as I am, and I am going to hell if it wasn't for the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's give God an applause for that. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't mean that if you give a lot of money, or it doesn't mean that if you have a lot of resources that you don't need Jesus. And I don't care if you're the richest person in the world or you're the poorest person in Wichita. We all need the love of Jesus and we all need forgiveness from him. Sin is like a virus. When Adam sinned, it spread sin through the entire world. There is no man or no woman that has ever lived that did not need the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus Christ. No man or no woman except for one. And his name is Jesus He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And he's the one to give to us the grace that we need to have. Have you ever been around people that, that are sick and they go to work? And you're just saying, just go home. Just go home. But they don't want to go home. They don't want to act. They don't, they're acting like they're not sick. And they're, they're sneezing and they're coughing all over the place. And the flu is all around us. And, and you're sitting there and you're trying to stay away from them. But they're just nasty sick. But they don't want to act like they're sick. And everybody knows that they're sick, but they don't want to admit that they're sick. And that is exactly what sin is within our life. Sin is a virus, just like sickness is a virus. And we can admit that I am sick, but sometimes we don't want to admit that I have sin. And until we can admit that we have sin, the grace does not work within our life. 
The Bible says we have to admit to God that I'm a sinner. And when I admit to God that I'm a sinner, I turn from my way. He will apply his grace to my life. But until I admit that I'm a sinner, God's grace does not work for my life. God's grace is given to me because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. He doesn't just say, I want you to get in the boat. I don't want you to get in the boat and go across the shore. He says, if you want that grace, get in the boat. What Jesus does, he says, can I put you in the boat? And all he asks you to do is say, yes, I will put you in the boat and we can go across the shore. He doesn't make us do anything. Grace is not because of what I have done. Grace is all because of what he has done. And he just wants us to reach up and say, Dad, I accept your forgiveness. I accept your grace. I love what you have done for me. But if the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through grace, through Jesus our Lord. In Romans 5.12 it says, Therefore, just as one man sin entered this world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. But listen to verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. Every man sin. But only one man can forgive. Every man has done something wrong, but only one man can forgive. The grace that has been given to us always wins because it's greater than anything that you've ever had. Now, I've had two boys grow up in my house, and I, I, I am not the smartest guy in the world. And when they got to about seventh grade, math was way out of my league. They brought home algebra and, and stuff. And they said, Dad, can you help me on this? Nope. <laughs> not even going to look at it. Because I look at that, and I know I'm an old man, but that is not the math that I did when I was their age. Somebody, us oh, old people, give me an amen. Because yeah. it is not math. That's just a bunch of numbers, a bunch of formulas. I didn't know anything. But, but you know what? When they were in about probably third grade, <laughs> fourth grade, I could at least help a little bit in math. Because I remember this, the greater than and the less than, okay? I can handle, that is greater and that is less than. I can handle that part of math. So when I look at greater than or less than, I want to look at grace as greater than anything that you put behind it. There is nothing greater than grace. You put any sin that you have, any action that you have done, you put anything in that, and I tell you, you put grace on that side, grace wins every time. Every sin that you've ever committed, if you put that sin beside your grace, Jesus takes your sin away, period. Now, it doesn't say the church. <laughs> it doesn't say the church takes your sin away, does it? The church can't forgive your sin. Yeah, you, you, you told me three years ago that you did this. Well, when I look at something, I can look, yeah, but, you know, three years ago. But I'm not full of grace. I'm not Jesus. When you give your sin to Jesus, grace is greater than all of your sin. Not greater than man. Jesus is greater than your sin. Men, women may not forgive, forget, and, and act like everything's wonderful, but Jesus Christ does. What we do is we believe what man says, and we forget of grace. Grace is not what man can give. Grace is what God can give. So we think that we're given our sin over to God, and we accept that forgiveness of God, but when man or woman will not forgive us the way that we think that they should, we do not experience the grace that we should have. Grace is greater than sin. God's great grace is greater than any of your sin. Every one of us, every one of us that have given our life to Christ has received his grace. But when you look at religion, our attempt to earn favor by adhering to rules and regulations I want to have God love me, so I'm going to go to church. 
I want God to love me, so I'm going to memorize the Bible. I want God to love me, so I'm going to give more money, or I'm going to go to camp, or I'm going to work in the nursery. If I do more, God will love me more. Well, that's rules, that's regulations, and that is religion. Religion and a relationship with Jesus Christ are two totally different things. But until we experience the grace of God, we cannot understand grace is greater than religion. Even Jesus came not to save the, sin, the, sin, the, the saved. He came to save the sinner. He came to help those that are in need. And sometimes the religious leaders of the day repelled against Jesus because Jesus came to take over the religious process. Because their religious process had nothing to do with grace. It had everything to do with rules, regulations, and laws. So let's dissect a few of those. What is the key word? The key word to religion or grace. The key word to religion is do. The key word to grace is done. The focus on religion is outward. The focus on grace is inward. The foundation of religion is rules and regulation. The foundation of grace is is real relationship with Jesus Christ. The motivation of religion is shame. The, the motivation of grace is gratitude. That's why, that's why when we sing, that's why we can lift up our hands and that's why we can close our eyes because the motivation is not out of obligation. It's out of love, respect, and gratitude. The feeling of religion is fear and frustration. The feeling of grace is freedom. If, if we've ever been to this point, and I hope that you have, that you've been busted in sin, that you've been broken and turned over and you feel worthless, and you're, you know, everything within your heart is feeling unworthy, feeling dirty and feeling broken and feel like you've ruined your life, but you have fallen on your face before God and God alone and said, Lord, forgive me of that sin. And God has restored to you and has given to you a clean heart. And when you get up from that time of prayer, you get up and say, I have been restored. I have the gratitude and the love. I'm not feeling fear and I don't have to have frustration. What I have is love towards God and with grace that gives me freedom. I don't have to walk around. I don't want you to sin. We, nobody ever wants somebody to sin. But when you sin, God still loves you. You mean God still loves you? When my boys back talk me, I may get mad at them when they don't do what I tell them they should have done, I may get upset at them. But guess what? I still love them. And God, nothing will separate me from the love of God. No sin, no back talking, nothing I can do will separate me from the love of God. And that is grace. And that gives me freedom. But here's the outcome of religion. Pride. Or guilt. I am better than you. I know more than you. I'm a Pharisee. So I'm going to stand at the corner and I'm going to pray loud prayers. I'm going to use big words and everybody's going to think that I'm the most spiritual person in the world and I'm going to sit there and I'm going to soak up all of their compliments because I am prideful. Or I look at the rules and the regulations of religion and I am buried in guilt. I can't live up to that. I, I, I don't know what to do. So what we do is we sneak out and we never talk to God. We never pray to Him or we never talk to Him. If our relationship is a religion, we either live in pride or we live in guilt. But if our love for God is grace. We live through love. God is love. 
So let me give you three greater thans. Grace is greater than religion. Grace is greater than religion. You can't explain grace. But Jesus gave to us the explanations of grace through this drama and through the word of God. So often when we try to explain grace, theologians today, they debate and churches split and denominations are in chaos because of this word of grace. Grace. There's all kinds of theological positions on grace, but here's the theological position I want to go to. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. The only grace that I care about is Jesus Christ loved me. He died on the cross for me, and I said, thank you, Lord, and he has received me. That is the grace that I hold on to. That is the grace that changes my life. E.B. White said this, grace can be dissected like a frog, but the thing dies in the process. Here's what grace has done for us in church. Grace has become of no effect. Because it's a word. It's something that we use in a sermon. It's something that we talk about. But it's not something that we give freely. Giving grace. Now, um, grace is a good thing. There was a, I'm not going to give incidents, incidents, but at camp this week. There was an issue at camp with a couple of campers. Now, the law, if we wrote down the letter of the law, the letter of law said these two boys should go home. They should go home. They did the wrong thing. They broke the law. They broke the, the rules. And because they broke the rules, the law says go home. Get on the, parent, get on the phone. Call the parents. Make them drive two and a half hours. That, that's what they need to do. But the leaders extended grace. And guess what? 30 minutes after they extended grace, what happened to those boys? They were patting each other on the back. They were laughing, having a good time with each other. Sometimes in our life, grace should be extended. Sometimes rules need to be followed. Well, they, they, sometimes, that's not a good thing. Rules should be followed. <laughs> but sometimes when we break the rules, we should extend grace. There's a story that you have all heard many times. In John chapter 8, Jesus was teaching the religious leaders of the day. And they tried to trap him. And they found this woman that was caught in adultery. And they carried this woman, bathed probably in a bed sheet, disgraced. They threw this lady down at the face of Jesus. I don't know where the man was, but he's just as guilty as the woman. Give me an amen. amen. But the woman's caught in adultery. Stone her. The religious leader says, the Bible says, Moses said, we have the authority and we have the right to stone her because she has broken the commandment. But Jesus, what do you say? Jesus looked at him, looked at her. But you remember, Jesus knew her, the beginning of the mother's womb. Jesus knew how many hairs she had on her head. Jesus knew every issue within her life. When Jesus looked into her eyes, he knew everything about her. So he looked up and he knew her broken condition, her fear, her shame. So he looked up at the religious leaders and he just knelt down on the ground and started writing something in the sand. And he got up and he said this, looking at their eyes. He saw their heart full of anger and animosity, trying to hate Jesus and trying to trip him up. And he said something so simple, but extended full grace. He said, you, religious, pious leaders, you, without sin, cast the first stone. And he reached back down, he started writing into the sand. One by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they just dropped their stone, walked away with hatred in their heart. Not for the girl, but for the one that extended the grace to the girl. And he looks up in the 
religious leaders are gone. He looks down at a woman full of shame, fear, and he says, where are thy accusers? She looks up, thinking that she's about ready to die. She was going to be stoned to death in public humiliation. She looks up and they're all gone. And she said, there are no accusers. And Jesus says something. Jesus doesn't wink at her sin. As Jesse said, he loves me too much to keep me in my sin. He reaches into her heart and he says, go, sin no more. I have extended to you grace. I give it to you while you need. Don't stay where you are. Use the grace that I've given to you to change your life, to love others, to extend grace to others. So here's the second grace. Grace is greater than your secret. Oh, yeah. Grace is greater than your secret. I guarantee you the worst day of her life was the day those religious leaders barged into that bedroom and pulled her out of that bed and threw her into public humiliation in front of Jesus. She was trying to live that secret life, but that secret life was then exposed. The worst day of her life honestly became the greatest day of her life because sin hidden has power. Sin exposed has grace. What is sin secret? I can live in this sin, and I can hide this sin, and I can do what I want in this sin because nobody knows. But once Jesus gets into your life, once that secret is exposed, that's when Jesus can wrap his arms around you and say this, I want to give you hope. I want to extend you grace. Go, sin, no more. See, grace is something that when we examine what grace is, grace is love. There's no freedom without grace. There's only fear, anxiety, and stress because of the secret sins of our life. But when we give God the secret sins of our life, he can baptize us in the grace of his love, and he can only help us when the sin of our life is in the light, exposed by God's love, then we can say, examine me, O Lord. Examine me in my life and let the sin of my life be exposed to God's word and the abundance of God's grace. And once I have given to him my sin, he can give to me the joy, the peace of grace. Grace is bigger is greater than your secret. But then grace is greater than your shame. I know you're a believer. I know that you go to church. But sometimes when grace is just a word, the shame of our life and the shame of our sin and the shame of our secrets is overbearing. So we hide our face from God we hide our truth from our family, and we live in shame. I'm not worthy. I've done too much. I don't think God can love me, and I don't think my family will forgive me. So I live in shame. Shameful to myself. I cannot look at my life and look at God and they too cannot be together because I'm just ashamed of what he would do to me. Well, we have missed the mindset of grace. Because grace is greater than all sin. Not just your sin or not just my sin. But grace covers all sin, hidden or exposed. Grace covered David's sin of adultery. He covered David's sin of murder. David was called a man after God's own heart because of grace. 
But so often we take the shame and the fear of being exposed of our sin and we hide it. And God says, I want you not to be ashamed. And the only way that we can go through life and not be ashamed is if we understand that God loves us more than any man, any woman, any child could ever love. We can look at you and we can say, I forgive you, but we always have that part of our heart that's always going to remember. But the Bible says that the love of God is different than the love of man. The love of God, nothing can separate us from the very love of God. Early on in uh, my ministry, we um, worked with teenagers. And uh, we were at a camp one year, and uh, we had a, uh, we worked in Arlington, Texas, and we had a, a bunch of, of hoodlum kids. And uh, they, some of them were pretty wild. And we had a few girls that went to camp with us that year. And we were trying to reach them. And a couple of them already had a couple children out of wedlock. And they, they were struggling. We were trying to minister to them and trying to give them the hope of Jesus. They did the music. And this was the first night of camp. They did the music and this preacher got up. And I don't blame the preacher for what he said because what he said is true. But how he said it, he was talking about grace and forgiveness. And he had a vase up here and he pulled out this beautiful red rose. And he started touching the red rose and playing with the rose and peeling off a petal and breaking it off. And then he said, I want you to all take a look at this rose. And so he passed the rose out into the audience and everybody took the rose. And then after about 10 minutes, he said, let me have that rose back up here. These girls were sitting right with us and I knew where he was going. And he said, nobody would want this rose. Nobody would want to be married to somebody that has been fondled and somebody that has been played with and somebody that has been used up. Who would want somebody like that. This beautiful red rose that God has created you to be is worthless now. And these girls sitting there, they're bawling. They had no hope. They thought, is this guy talking about me? Nobody would want me. And everything within my soul wanted to say, Jesus wants her. Quit talking about a rose. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about grace. Let's talk about forgiveness. These girls need Jesus. Yeah, let's talk about morality. Let's talk about what they need to do. But sinners, sin. Preachers, preach Jesus. Preach forgiveness. And once they are forgiven, once we've extended them grace, we can teach them we can model for them, but let's not forget the purpose of the church. Extend grace. Sinners, yeah, they're going to sin. Church, when sinners sin and they come in our door, guess what we need to do? Extend grace. Love unconditionally train model encourage but never condemn Jesus the greatest giver of grace in John chapter 8 a woman caught thrown down could be dead he could have said you're right dirty rotten trash let's stone her and he had every right that's what the Bible says to do. But he reached down with empathy, compassion, and gave her grace. Grace. There's not a better word. There's not a more beautiful word than grace. We all needed it. And we all need to extend it. We as individuals and we as the church. If grace could be brought into a sentence, 
is Jesus died on the cross for my sins. That's grace. Let me extend to others what Jesus gave to me. Not a religion. Not rules. And not regulations. One word. And if we live by one word, grace, you'll find inner beauty and inner peace and happiness that you've never, ever, ever experienced before.